morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual Grand Rounds event, Global Equity During Pandemics, Lessons from HIV and COVID for Designing a New Paradigm. This event is hosted in partnership between the Harvard Global Health Institute and the Harvard University Center for AIDS Research. My name is Ingrid Katz, and I'm the Associate Faculty Director at the Institute. I'm joined here by my colleague, Dr. Raj Gandhi, the co-director and principal investigator at the Harvard CIFAR and director of HIV clinical services and education at Massachusetts General Hospital. We're so pleased to have you all joining us today for what promises to be an insightful, practical discussion with a remarkable group of experts. Today's conversation will be oriented towards strengthening our understanding of the lessons from HIV and their applications for the current pandemic and future ones. We hope to assess the main global equity concerns related to COVID-19 prevention and treatment in 2022 and identify how we, the HIV community, can most effectively advocate for and achieve global COVID-19 equity. Ultimately, we aim to consider what a future paradigm may look like for achieving global prevention and treatment equity throughout this pandemic and future. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, pleasure to be with you today. Uh, history has taught us that global pandemics like HIV and COVID require a global and coordinated response. In the early days of HIV, we rapidly learned that there was a critical need to develop the scientific underpinning to respond to that newly discovered virus. The tide began to turn in our response when people with HIV, the community, clinicians and scientists came together to develop the science, to conduct clinical trials to find out what treatments worked and to advance the search for vaccines and diagnostics. Those efforts in HIV continue to this day, including through the Centers for AIDS Research, which are focused on supporting multidisciplinary research aimed at reducing the burden of HIV, both here in the United States and around the world. But what we learned with HIV was that developing diagnostics and treatments were not enough to effectively respond to the epidemic. To realize the benefits of the clinical and scientific advances, we needed to develop systems and structures, systems and structures like PEPFAR and the Global Fund to provide equitable and global access to those diagnostics and treatment. The same lesson is applicable to COVID-19 and to future pandemics. We need to develop structures and systems so that equity is at the forefront of our response and not an afterthought. The challenges are clear when it comes to achieving global equity in COVID vaccines. About 60% of the world's population has received a dose of a COVID vaccine, but less than 10% of people in low-income countries have received a COVID vaccine dose. Of the 3 billion people who remain unvaccinated around the world, almost 90% live in developing countries. And similar disparities will occur with COVID therapeutics and diagnostics unless we redouble our efforts to ensure global equity in our pandemic response. So as Dr. Katz said, today, during today's event, we will come together to discuss the lessons from HIV and how to apply them to COVID. We will talk about the most pressing scientific and implementation challenges facing us as a community in achieving control over the COVID pandemic. And we'll discuss, based on lessons drawn from HIV and COVID, how to develop a more just and equitable, equitable approach to responding to future pandemics. Thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. So before we get started, we have a few housekeeping notes. This event is being streamed through Zoom and a recording will be made available on the Harvard Global Health Institute website and this a YouTube page, as well as the Harvard University CIFAR website. Today's event is going to include a 45 minute panel discussion followed by a 30 minute fireside chat. Many of you have sent us questions which we have incorporated into our discussion today. Although we may not have additional time to answer questions live, 
we do encourage you to put any questions you have into the Q&A function for our consideration following the event. With that note, we have enabled the chat if you would like to just put where you are from today. We always love to see where people are calling in from. It gives us a sense of our community here. So you are welcome to put in where you are calling in from today. Um, our colleague Luke is manning that right now. With that note, I will pass it back to Dr. Gandhi to introduce our moderators for our panel today. So I'm pleased to introduce to you now the moderators for today's panel discussion. Dr. Galit Alter is the co-director of the Harvard University Center for Research. She's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a faculty member at the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT and Harvard. Dr. Alter's re research over the past decade has focused on dissecting the role of the innate immune response and antibodies in the control and clearance of infectious diseases, including HIV and COVID. She's joined today by Dr. Shaheen Lachman, who is an executive committee member of the Harvard University Center for AIDS Research and an associate professor of medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Lachman has worked tirelessly with colleagues in Botswana for 25 years to conduct clinical research and mentoring related to HIV with a focus on optimizing antiretroviral treatment during and after pregnancy. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Alter and Dr. Lachman. Greetings. We welcome you warmly to our panel discussion and are honored and delighted to introduce our distinguished panelists who bring a truly remarkable wealth and breadth of relevant expertise and wisdom to this meeting. Each panelist has tackled inequities in the HIV pandemic response, and each is now applying their insights from this work to similar inequities in the global COVID response. In order to maximize the time that we have to hear from them, we will provide only brief introductions to the panelists as it would take most of our time together to actually do justice to their accomplishments. Please see the online event announcement for additional details. Ruth Okediji is the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and co-director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. A leading global expert in international intellectual property law, Professor Okediji has advised intergovernmental organizations, regional economic communities, and national governments on a range of matters related to technology, innovation policy, and development. Professor Okediji works closely with several United Nations agencies, research centers, and international organizations on the human development effects of international intellectual property policy, including access to knowledge, access to essential medicines, and issues related to indigenous innovation systems, all of which are clearly highly relevant to today's discussion. Paul Farmer is a Colicatronis University Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also the Chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Co-Founder and Chief Strategist at Partners in Health, PIH. For over three decades, Dr. Farmer has remained a dedicated leader in community-based solutions to healthcare, improving health systems infrastructure, and providing equitable, accessible, and high-quality health care for people in low-income countries across the globe. James Krellenstein is the co-founder of and managing director of strategy and policy at Prep for All, where he leads the organization's research and policy agenda. Prep for All is an organization of community members, healthcare professionals, lawyers, and academics who work together to increase access to life-saving HIV medications through direct action, media, and political advocacy. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Prep for All acted swiftly to advocate for policies that would markedly improve the global availability of COVID-19 vaccines and to outline a comprehensive COVID-19 research agenda. In this ensuing 45-minute discussion, we will ask the panelists to discuss some lessons learned from HIV that are relevant to the global COVID-19 response, potential approaches and even new paradigms that could truly improve equity in responding to COVID and future pandemics and that are within our reach, and their advice on how we can take effective steps to advance global COVID equity, including through advocacy. <laughs> 
Dr. Alter will start us off now. Thanks, Shaheen. So good morning, good evening to all those on the call, wherever you are in the world. We are thrilled to start the conversation um, with one question that I wanted to ask to all of the panelists. And so what I thought is maybe, Paul, you could take a first stab at it, then James, and then Ruth. But the question is really, I think, on everyone's mind. That is, what are the most important lessons, both failures as well as successes, that we have learned from the HIV response that can help inform our global COVID-19 response? Paul, I'm going to hand it off to you first. Thanks, Galit. Um, you know, there, there are so many uh, important lessons, some of them very specific on how to structure programs, but I, I don't think that's where we want to start. I, I you know, we have a, uh, already Raj has mentioned, you know, looking back over history, and I'm sure that will come up again, but uh, it really was PEPFAR itself, the first uh, equity platform that reached out from the affluent world across the globe. Of course, you could point to problems with it, implementation problems or, uh, you know, lack of inclusion of some, of some settings. But if you look back at colonial rule under which, you know, 90% of the Af African continent, much of India, much of Asia, much of Latin America, I mean, colonial rule is the shared experience. And during that time, how often do we see major efforts to share the wealth, especially if it was therapeutic? If it was designed to pre prevent an outbreak, to protect livestock and investments, well, the British were sure to do it. Uh, the French were only happy to do it. The Germans were only happy, happy to do it. So, I mean, I think what really shook up global health and, you know, tardily, alas, was this massive effort to say, we're not gonna only focus on disease control, which is of course a concern of all of ours, but also on taking people, care of people who are sick or likely to come, become sick. So this integration of prevention and care uh, was really novel on, on a scale like that. I, I can't point to a single other example. And so I think even if we just had that and the work of the AIDS activists who made this along with you know, people like Tony Fauci who, who made this, and George W. Bush for that matter, who made this happen, we can point to that and say, well, you know, here's something that showed us that with the right amount of funds, you could actually find the staff, the stuff, the space, the systems to save uh, literally millions of lives of those already sick to prevent millions of new infections. So I think you know, every time we get together and if we can go back and look at those lessons, it's a good thing. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that equity platform play itself out yet with, with COVID and nor have we with hepatitis C. And of course, you know, it's not just pandemic disease. You know, where's our cancer care uh, equity platform? Where's our you know, uh, renal failure equity platform? So I, I think there are lots of lessons in there and I'm sure we're, we're gonna have a chance to go into deeper depth, depth about the programs. James. So I think there are, you know, obviously we could probably have the entire session just about this uh, and many sessions more on this question. But in, in thinking about what we learn from HIV and how we're gonna apply it to COVID, especially in the global equity context, I think the, the lessons are, there are two primary lessons I would deduce. The first is that as Paul just said, we can actually do this. We can, you know, there was a lot of skepticism when PEPFAR was first introduced that we were going to be able to ultimately get people on once daily antiretroviral therapy or even before once daily therapy. But we actually did it. And we see in many cases that PEPFAR countries do much better than the United States actually does at getting people on treatment and virally suppressed. And I think that the exact same lesson can be applied here. I have no doubt that every country in the world, if given the resources to do so, can adequately vaccinate their population as well, if not better than the United States is doing. But the second lesson that I really take from it is, is that there's a political problem that we have in global health, which is that it took more than seven years from the introduction of the first effective antiretroviral therapies for HIV treatment in 95, 96, till we actually got PEPFAR launched. Millions of people died in that interim. And that was just a question of political will. Did we have the political will to force a system to equitably provide treatments for HIV? And we're seeing that in high speed today with COVID. You know, just since Joe Biden took office back in January of 2021, almost you know, a year tomorrow, right? 7.1 million people globally have died from COVID-19. And almost every single one of those deaths was preventable. 
had we actually had universal accessibility to vaccines and support for programs to administer them, we would have almost seen almost none of those deaths occur. And we are in this place today, as we speak, right this moment, where we are not setting ourselves up for success in this endeavor to globally vaccinate the population, to ensure that people have access to diagnostics and treatment. And I have to say, the rate limiting step, the sort of reason why we're not making progress right now is because there's not political will among world leaders and especially among our government. And that's the one lesson that I would take. The one most important thing is that we are in a political crisis as much today as we are in a biomedical crisis in dealing with COVID-19. Great, Ruth. Thank you so much. Just building on that, I think it's important to note that in my view, the lack of legal infrastructure to facilitate the distribution and access to life-saving medicines um, was an immense failure um, during the HIV AIDS crisis and remains a failure today. It is part of what contributes to and reinforces um, the weak political will to which uh, James has, has referenced and even some of the failings um, of PEPFAR, which as Paul notes, uh, was a wonderful um, um, innovation. And so in, in, in my view, and, and this is of course, you know, being a hammer, you always see the nail um, without question, um, the question of, of how we fund and finance pharmaceutical innovation remains a critical challenge for public health today. And regardless of political will, we need to think about um, the financing um, of innovation. If we begin thinking about equity only once the pandemic hits, we're already late. When we think about access to medicines, it's, it's not just a popcorn ad hoc approach to saving lives. It's got to be a consistency, uh, a resilient framework that can spring into action, that is adept, that is agile, and that already incorporates the needs of the most vulnerable. That is a lesson from HIV um, AIDS crisis and a lesson um, in COVID-19. I think if we can break the box of how to incentivize innovation, without sacrificing human life and human dignity, uh, we will come a long way. And that I think is really critical. Let me also say that um, related to that is our reliance um, on the private sector. Uh, the federal government uh, could do more um, in the sense of both exercising its own influence in grant making and in thinking about voluntary licensing schemes um, and other legal levers that facilitate a collaborative approach to pricing, differential pricing, for example, ways that are already built into government grants, um, into government funding, especially given the changed model that we saw with COVID-19, with government advanced market purchasing and funding for the R&D to produce um, some of the vaccines. And so I, I think there is an important need to recognize that unless we clear the legal space and include levers in government granting mechanisms to ensure that the private sector is not itself alone responsible um, or left with um, the power over global markets to access vaccines, um, we are going to see um, not only a repeat of some of our challenges in the HIV AIDS world, but we will see a rolling back of some of our gains. As we know, those with HIV AIDS remain vulnerable, most vulnerable um, to infection. And, and those who are living in Sub-Saharan Africa um, are of course unvaccinated. These structural problems and these legal considerations about financing, access and grant making by governments remain crucial lessons for us from the HIV AIDS crisis. Thank you all. Shaheen, I'm gonna let you go into some deeper questions. Yes, th thank you very much. And the kind of the next group of questions really pertains to what you were just speaking to, uh, Ruth. So it's a perfect segue. But before we go into those questions, I, it's, and based upon your responses so far in this first theme of what we've learned from HIV, I'm curious uh, to hear your thoughts from, from each of you, um, if you feel like sharing, 
as, as to whether what lessons we learned, what, what the impact was of the generics manufacturing for antiretroviral drugs and the regulatory changes that accompanied um, that manufacturing and wh whether any of that and to what extent and how it is affecting our approach to COVID vaccines and therapeutics. I mean, we clearly learned some lessons, but are we taking them to heart? What impact do you think they're having or not having for COVID? And maybe James, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, sure, I can start. Um, you know, I think it's important to realize um, while there's a lot of, I think, broad lessons that we could learn, in particular from the generic process for making ARVs, as well as the regulatory changes, it's important that we distinguish those, some of the, the differences, right? You know, vaccines are not small molecule therapeutics like antiretroviral drugs are. So they're actually very, very different um, in terms of actually making sort of quote unquote generic vaccines, right? We generally need to repeat clinical trials when we're making a new manufacturer, even of the originator's version of the vaccine. And the second problem is just scale, right? You know, there's 40 million people living with HIV today. Uh, we're dealing with a problem in COVID where we're talking about making billions and billions of vaccine doses. And so we're looking at, you know, in 2019, we manufactured globally for all all types of vaccines combined, we manufacture about 5.5 billion doses of vaccines. We need probably on the order of 11 to 20 billion doses of just COVID-19 vaccines to manufacture, uh, to actually deal with this pandemic, at least as, uh, for the first stab. And so we actually are in a really interesting industrial policy problem. And it goes to a, pro uh, a point that Ruth just made, which is that the reliance, particularly of the White House on the private sector to solve this problem has been fundamentally flawed flawed, right? The problem that we're seeing today in vaccine manufacturing is we're not seeing the vaccine manufacturers putting in the capital investments that are necessary to actually produce at the scale we need to of the types of vaccines we need, uh, which is why you have a company like Moderna, right, a couple of miles away in Kendall Square from where you guys are sitting today, that has only basically made enough vaccine to date globally to vaccinate 280 million people globally. And Moderna is one of the most effective vaccines, one that has the best cold chain that we can see, you know, globally for de global deployment. And they just haven't made the investments that we need to actually scale that manufacturing. And we haven't seen the federal government realize this problem and step in and one, force the manufacturers to really scale production, but to provide the funding that is necessary to build the capital infrastructure to make the number of doses that we need. Instead, they are falsely hoping that the private market will just miraculously solve this problem, which it will not, and it hasn't. And we really do need to learn that lesson here. Thank you. I would just add. Yeah, please go ahead. I would just add um, a, a complexity to, to all that James has said. I think it's important from the perspective of the global South in particular, that the legacy of colonialism really continues perhaps most palpably in the area of global health. Um, and while there's been tremendous advances, um, the reality is that um, th there are very limited policies targeting the capacity of these countries to engage in local manufacturing, which as my colleague Terry Fisher and I have recently argued in a recent paper, it is indispensable to have local manufacturing. If we're going to be serious about equity, local manufacturing has got to become a reality. And South Africa, uh, Rwanda, Nigeria, several countries have been talking about this and I cannot emphasize this enough, but in order for local manufacturing to actually work, um, the generic brand name landscape, the regulatory framework becomes really important. One thing to keep in mind um, is that generic manufacturing still requires some regulatory system to ensure that access to the know-how, access to the technology is made available. Um, it's important to, to remember that technology transfer, if things are kept mostly as a trade secret and not patented, we have additional legal hurdles. And it's also critical to clear the legal space in the countries um, that are interested in partaking um, and in investing in local manufacturing. This means that we have to decouple access to medicines from the international trade system where it is currently residing. Our global, uh, our, our global health policy 
sits really in this awkward relationship between executive power and the United States Trade Representative's Office. While the Biden administration has approved um, an, an IP a waiver, as I've argued and several others, the waiver itself is not enough because you must transfer technology. As James has noted, vaccine technology is not that simple. And there's a lot on the ground that must be done to enable developing countries and, and lower income countries to equip them for local manufacturing and for the kind of effective policies that make the distribution at scale for their populations possible. It is not meaningful to simply waive intellectual property rights or to have licensing um, mechanisms if the technology that is needed is not also effectively transferred. If, if, I, if I could just add something and, and uh... You know, I, I'm actually not near Kendall Square, James, but as you know, I'm in central rural Rwanda. And just to draw on both of those uh, points, the ones that James made about the scale of the need and that Ruth made about the importance of manufacturing, even when we have uh, medications that are long off patent, uh, you know, sometimes there's, you know, price gouging. Very often there's price gouging from the uh, big pharma sector, even though they haven't controlled the, the patents for many long years and decades, you know, unless there is an equity platform, as Ruth said, you're really not going to be able to <clears throat> have a substantial impact on, certainly on a population level. And I just will go back to, you know, if I have a question about, uh, you know, uh, patents or patent law, or the activism required to change them. I would go to Ruth or James, but what I can tell you from my experience as a clinician, just to go back to those years between 1996, when it was quite clear that a multi-drug regimen of antiretroviral therapy would suppress HIV and prevent loss of life. Between those years and the PEPFAR and, and, uh, and the Global Fund, as James said, millions and millions of lives were lost uh, and millions of new infections occurred. To give you an idea, if you have an equity platform, and I'll just say that to me, Partners in Health is and was meant as an equity platform, and even as an effort to fight the colonial mentality, which suggested that some people, they really only need prevention, not care. Just going back to those difficult years with a mix, uh, first of all, we were finding a three drug regimen with drugs we don't use very much anymore was $10,000 per patient per year just for the medications. And Tony Fauci later corrected me and said, it's more like 15, it was more like 15. At the same time in those years when there were so few uh, people on therapy outside of affluent countries and certainly very few on the most affected continent, we were paying as partners in health only less than $1,000 per patient per year, which now seems even astronomical because of the engagement of generic manufacturers. We started first working with the world's largest man, uh, uh, accretor of, of generic medications in the Netherlands. And then as more and more uh, generic meds came online from India and elsewhere, including South Africa, the price kept drop, dropping. You saw new players get involved like the Clinton Foundation. And now we're talking about, uh, for a really good regimen, very often about $60 per patient per year. And this is the fruit, uh, not just of activism, we're most proud of that, but of uh, you know, having the resources necessary to buy these medications. And I remember, and, and I'll stop here, uh, Shaheen, I remember when uh, <clears throat> you know, some, some, some people were arguing, well, even with generics, it's still gonna be too expensive. But who was arguing that? It was largely people in development and public health who were repeating their old tired claims that it was not cost effective, not sustainable, not feasible, and in fact, not even prudent, which you know is just the kind of nutty stuff that we're talking about today with COVID therapeutics, diagnostics, and preventives. It's the same thing with cancer drugs. So we have to fight this mentality of thinking that some lives are worth less than others. Thank you very much um, for, for those remarks, uh, each of you. Um, and this kind of leads us into the, a, a, a few additional questions that maybe, maybe we can seek um, some solace in your responses as to 
the steps that could be taken now that may actually be effective to improve this um, supply challenge. And I, I will also just note, and Paul, you alluded to this, that despite voluntary licensing of two oral antivirals that would permit lower income countries to access low cost generic versions, I think there's growing concern that in addition to inequities in vaccine supplies, which are you know glaringly evident, uh, scarcity of new and effective COVID treatments will further exacerbate global uh, disparities. So this is not just a vaccine issue, it's an upcoming treatment issue. Um, so I, Ruth, I, I wanted to ask you, building on what you, you shared, what do you think are some important additional levers that are available to the US government now or soon to improve supply and global access to critical vaccines and therapeutics? Some just a, there, there are so many things that could be done. And as you've said before, we could get lost in the thicket of them. But I guess what, what are some things that we could be thinking about doing now? So let me just mention um, a point that, that I don't want us to lose in, in our global, uh, in the global context of our conversation. And that is that inequities also exist in the United States. It's the same pattern. The, mo the, more, the most vulnerable um, um, in poorer communities, communities of color. And, and there's a, a, a sort of a nesting of issues that, that make it hard um, for us to accomplish equitable outcomes, even in the United States. And, and that tells us that there's a structural problem. One thing that um, has been on the table and that recently got some action is, uh, is the, the idea of a pandemic treaty. Um, a legal framework that both obligates countries internally and externally to coordinate in their efforts to ensure that we have a resilience um, um, in our capacity to respond to global health pandemics. Um, I, I'm cautiously optimistic about, about a, a pandemic treaty. Um, as articulated by the World Health Organization, uh, the treaty um, would really address things that Paul has raised, like early detection um, and prevention. Um, so covering diagnostics, it would address uh, issues of um, building uh, community health networks to improve resilience on the ground, um, responsiveness uh, to future pandemics, and universal and equitable access is woven in to what I would call uh, the, the call or the charge um, of the treaty. It was just um, approved um, by the World Health Assembly for negotiations to begin, um, and negotiations are slated to begin um, this year. Having been involved um, as uh, a member of the United Nations um, Secretary General's high level panel on, on access to medicines um, some years back, I will just observe that, that, that it was really difficult to experience um, a commitment and vision by our government leadership. And I think one of the key things that I would say is that public health is not just a governance issue with a big G. It is a governance issue with a little G. Every citizen, every one of us has a responsibility to think about ways in which health and health equity is woven into our core concerns about democracy and about access um, to the basic necessities of human life. As Paul mentioned, every life has value. And so the idea that we have legal frameworks that reinforce this disparate treatment, this inequity, um, should be something that we are all um, uh, un dissatisfied with. And so I would say that thinking about ways to encourage constructive participation, particularly when it comes to ideas that um, force public-private partnerships that encourage the private sector um, to think about differential pricing or tiered pricing or other ways in which the access issues can be addressed is going to be a critical part of this treaty. And that historically, even with the HIV AIDS pandemic, with the Doha declaration, we had a wonderful outburst of hope and expectation that that declaration would create a legal framework that would facilitate equitable access to medicines. And as we know, um, we, we had less than five licenses issued under that framework. Um, there were so many problems with implementation um, that it died a very slow death. And um, that should not happen with a pandemic treaty. And we all need to be engaged in thinking about a workable, fair, and sustainable program and policy 
that will ensure that the government regulations and our trade sanctions and all of the ways in which we play a leadership role globally reflect the primacy of access to medicines as a core function of little g governance. Thank you so much. And I have just one last question for James um, related to this topic before handing back to Galit, if that's okay. And James, you, you work very solidly in this space as well. Um, so I, we wanted to hear your thoughts on actions, real, some of the more promising approaches that we could take right now or steps that we could take right now to really meaningfully increase the manufacturing of and global access to vaccines and therapeutics for COVID. Well, I think, you know, we need to, you know, to go back on what Paul and Ruth just said about every life mattering. Let's just understand where we are right now. Right now, every 7.5 seconds, a person is dying from COVID-19. The level of viral transmission that is going on globally is cataclysmic. And it really does pose a threat. Every new transmission, every new infection is a new possibility for this virus to evolve uh, into a new variant that could be potentially disastrous for everybody. And the thing that needs to happen right now is we actually need our political leaders to actually take steps that they have the power to do today to actually begin the end of this pandemic. And, you know, I, I saw Professor Carlos Del Rio in the chat uh, at Emory, you know, ask, what is our sort of act up of COVID-19? And I think, you know, we do need this sort of act up moment at this point. When we have to understand that the federal government, that our federal government, the American federal government, the United States federal government has unique power to really ensure both that we can scale up these, the, the production of these vaccines and therapeutics and also do the technology transfer that Ruth is talking about around the world so that we actually get decentralized manufacturing. The problem is they're not doing it. You know, we have, the Congress back in March allocated over $16 billion to the Biden administration to scale vaccine manufacturing, including for global manufacturing. And we know that's about the range that we would need to get into a place where you can make, say, 16 billion doses of mRNA-1273, the Moderna vac mRNA vaccine. The problem is that Jeff Zients, who is the current COVID uh, sort of czar in the White House, refused to spend any of that money on scaling vaccine manufacturing. Jeff Zients also has the power, has been allocated by the White House the power under the Defense Production Act to compel technology transfer from companies like Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech to other global manufacturers. He has not done that either. And the pro and what where we're in right now is that we do not have the tools necessary to bring this pandemic under control. And that doesn't, that means not only that there are millions of deaths that are happening globally that are completely unnecessary, it threatens every single one of our health because we've already gone through two very devastating variants, right? Delta and Omicron. And we're on track at this point to have a bunch more variants until we actually deal with this problem. So what I would like to have see someone from the White House, and maybe we can get Tony to answer this question next, is why hasn't this White House actually spent the money that is necessary to actually scale manufacturing both here and abroad to get, get us enough mRNA vaccines that we need? Why hasn't the White House compelled technology transfer from Moderna, from Pfizer, to actually ensure global manufacturing um, so that we don't have this reliance on just the global north for everyone's vaccine doses? Why is the White House today um, not asking the Congress for more money to deal with problems with global uh, distribution and, and vaccine administration? Jeff Zients today, just last week, said we don't need a dollar more in, to fight Omicron despite the fact that we are out of money to support health programs around the world to get vaccines into arms. What will it take for this White House to do what is necessary to bring this pandemic under control? This is a goddamn political crisis, and it's time that we actually act that way. And it's time that we demand our leaders protect not only global health, but our health as well, and start ending these inequities that are really a threat to every single one of us. And this is doable, it is achievable, but it will not occur until we see some political leadership from this White House, which we have not seen. Thank you, James. Um, I think this is a really important conversation that we're going to have to have in the next session, but I'm going to move on to Paul for one more second. And Paul, I want to ask you a question going back to historical references and historical experiences, and to ask you, based on your experiences with HIV and Ebola, how should we structure systems to anticipate and counteract inequities in pandemic responses, in particular related to access to effective prevention and therapeutic agents? I think we've talked 
quite a bit about vaccines, but there's, you know, another landscape that we, um, that you addressed earlier about this integrated care. And so I'd like you just to um, help us think through that question. Well, you know, again, I, 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 sometimes we don't want to speculate on what kind of, you know, mentality would drive forward this insistence that, you know, things that we would regard, or I would regard for me and my family as necessary, like, you know, enough booster doses or cancer care, if I were to fall ill with cancer, we have, still have to find ways of attacking the idea that, uh, that, you know, other people don't need that. And, you know, just to go back to Ebola for a second, and, um, and Ron Klain was actually the, the Ebola czar, as you'll recall, recall. Um, <clears throat> the same argument that we're having now played itself out. And that is, in this setting of a clinical desert, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, we don't need to do anything other than give oral rehydration salts. You know, and I was like, wow, not again. We're going to do the same thing again and again, suggest a lower standard of care uh, for people living in poverty, particularly black and brown people. Um, and that's exactly what happened really throughout the throughout the, the epidemic in, in West Africa is that there was this insistent that, you know, inferior services, whether in the prevention arena and especially in the care arena, were not cost effective, not feasible, too dangerous, uh, and not worth it, and generally imprudent. And by the way, this is all public discussion. I mean, people from big NGOs and international <clears throat> standard setting bodies did not hesitate, as they didn't around HIV or cancer care or whatever, to say this stuff out loud. You know, it's uh, all a matter of public debate. I would have thought that after all these experiences that we're talking about, including PEPFAR, that it would have been a little bit more embarrassing <clears throat> for them to make these claims. And the them I'm talking about are not people living in rural villages in Sierra Leone. There are peers who are part of the global health infrastructure, which as Ruth says, is one of the, in some ways, least decolonized spaces, you know, in, in, you know, in, certainly in, in the circles that I move. And, and I move mostly in clinical circles, but I know those ones pretty well. A lot of these you know, noxious ideas, you know, come from our peers. And, you know, this is again why uh, Carlos uh, Del Rio said, we need, a, we need an act up for, for COVID. We, and we're gonna always need an act up because as Ruth said, the dark side of developing new and effective technologies is that without an equity plan, they almost invariably widen the outcome gap between those who have access and those who don't. So in other words, it is structurally given that we will have divergent outcomes as more good things are available, but they're only available to people who can pay them, which is the neoliberal you know, paradigm, then we're not gonna be able to address. These are other problems, certainly not problems on this scale. So we have to fight back. And I think that's the most useful thing we can do. Some of that may be fighting back like, you know, by working with you know, governments like the ones in Rwanda, you know, uh, like the one in Rwanda, where we know that they're pushing for this equity agenda as part of their official policy, um, you know, both in the everyday, uh, you know, management of clinical problems in this country, but also in thinking about uh, vaccine production capacity here. So, you know, I think this, we have a, a cultural problem and a mentality problem, but the problem is really from us. I certainly wouldn't say it's from like the villages we're outside our window here. Thanks, those are really critical points. And so, so maybe I can keep going on this theme and maybe direct a question at both James and Ruth. And, and this really um, pertains to this you know, clear um, list of inadequacies in how we've responded to this pandemic, where we should have learned lessons from HIV and from other pandemics. But maybe I can ask in an ideal world where this pandemic treaty may change the game in the future, where do you see the most you know, critical Achilles heels that will break down that treaty from actually making a difference? What are the most critical parts of this response that we feel that we have to pay attention to in order to make sure that it will be a successful path forward for this pandemic as well as others? So maybe I'll pass it over to James first and then Ruth, give you a minute to think through um, how we can address this issue. So, you know, in thinking about, um, uh, about what 
in planning for the next pandemic, let's 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 talk maybe on that frame. You know, one of the things that we're very very worried about is what really was our Achilles heel in this pandemic, which was the industrial capacity to actually manufacture at the level and scale that we need uh, for medical countermeasures. That might be actually very complicated in some cases, like a cell-based therapeutic or maybe even a, a nucleic acid-based therapeutic, as we're dealing with right now. And the problem that we're going to have ultimately is this insistence that you know, in a normal non-pandemic times, we're gonna have maybe an order of magnitude in some cases less demand than we actually have during a pandemic. And this is why our current reliance so heavily on private industry around the world to prepare for pandemics is I think fatally misguided and flawed, right? We do need at some point the sustainment of the industrial infrastructure to make a whole host of therapeutics and diagnostics that actually can scale to the level we need for a pandemic that needs to be maintained over 10 or 20 or 30 years maybe until the next pandemic, God forbid, occurs. And I think that's something that we really should have learned the lesson from COVID-19 just because all of a sudden we went from a world where we need 5.5 billion doses of, one, of all vaccines combined to 11 plus billion doses of, of a, just a specific vaccine and using a specific technology. And that really brings us back to the fact that we're going to need to see public democratic control of some of these manufacturing um, capacity, right? The capacity to actually um, manufacture medical countermeasures. And one of the proposals that we have been strongly advocating is that for the US government and other governments around the world to really actually have public ownership of manufacturing capacity for me medical countermeasures. So if we're gonna pour a couple of billions of dollars into making you know, enough mRNA vaccine manufacturing capacity for the world, well, the people should actually have some control of that. Maybe we'll have it operated by a private operator like Lanza or something. But we do need to have public control and continuous public investment in that capacity if we're gonna rely on it for the next pandemic. Thanks. Ruth. Thank you so much, Glee. Um, you know, let me just say that, that political crises have a longer life than most human beings. And that means that while we are addressing both the reluctance and the challenges that politically face the creation of a system that is sustainable and resilient, we still have to find ways to save lives. And so um, I would just suggest a number of things that, that we need to consider that were the Ackley's heel um, in our HIV AIDS context and that I think remain problematic today. The first I think is a fundamental commitment to the idea that innovation only can occur if we have made less risky the pathways of innovation and the guarantees of economic return. We've, we've turned public health into a gold mine and, and, and while, that's, while that certainly needs to be changed, we are going to have to work around that to save the lives that are being lost every seven seconds. That means private public partnerships have got to rise um, as an important corollary to the changes in government and in policy and in regulatory frameworks that we so desperately need for the long term. Um, there needs to be um, an insistence that publicly funded innovation must produce publicly oriented results. Um, that's, that, that is a minimum. That's fairness. That's law. That's what we expect um, in a well-governed uh, democracy. And frankly, that's what we expect with the rule of law. And let me just say that this is a point that we must also translate in the global context. Um, I, I'm often reminded that the Ebola crisis was um, very quickly addressed um, in Nigeria not just because of the high transmiss transmissibility and the death rate, but because it emerged first in Lagos, the most wealthy, most capital intensive, and most important city in the country. If this had erupted in a tiny village on the border, I wonder often, would we have seen the results that we did? And so translating our commitment to the equality of lives into the international architecture of the treaty is going to be crucial. Second, because third, because we have an incentive system for innovation, which I, I think has done remarkable things in the history of medical innovation, 
it means that we're going to need to think about the incentives for generics. Generics have, have not um, flourished in the new bold world of free market pharmaceutical innovation as, as they should. And we all know that we need competition in order to have a, an affirmative impact on pricing, but also to encourage scaling and encourage access. So we've got to think about what's the relationship between generics and brand name techn um, medical um, manufacturing within this treaty. We are always in the international space very comfortable talking about the public response and the, and the sovereign obligations and the big, wide, often superficial commitments. But actually working with markets is a requirement for health equity. It was a requirement during HIV AIDS. It is a requirement during COVID-19. It will be a requirement in the next pandemic. And we know that there will be a next pandemic. Last point in terms of an Achilles heel is the failure to account for the ways in which the normative commitments are undercut by private contractual deals. And often because these deals are not transparent, we do not understand the ways in which generics are suppressed, including in the United States, the ways in which distribution channels um, rely if they're the subject of licensing, we then rely on other um, intellectual property levers to, to, to exacerbate and, 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 and widen the equity gaps. Um, and so we need to think very carefully in this treaty to avoid making the same mistakes we made with the Doha Declaration, which ended up not really producing the outcomes. We've got to think carefully about the mechanisms that are available, the interaction between local and international norms to ensure that the scaling, the dissemination, the availability of the technology and the political space to clear, legally clear, the work of vaccine manufacturing occurs. Let me just say lastly that we have seen a rise in falsified vaccines. And Terry Fisher and I at the law school have been working in Mozambique and in Namibia and South Africa on how to track the production of falsified medicines. Because as we are dealing with scaled up production and depressed access, what's happening is that a black market for falsified or substandard medicines has emerged, killing people even as we are trying to save lives. And we cannot ignore the gaps that we learned existed in the Doha framework in this current new pandemic treaty. The negotiators must keep in mind that equity begins not only in the commitment, but in the implementation and the working out of the gaps that must be addressed. Unbelievable, that's scary. Um, so I'll pass it over to Shaheen to close off this session. Thank you uh, very much for, for all of these remarks. We have only three minutes. And before registration and during uh, here in the chat, we have received many questions and comments related to the role that each of us can play. So building upon your decades of experience in, in advocacy and um, and uh, scholarly work around HIV, maybe each of you could spend one minute giving some of your insights on how we in the US and globally can mobilize to most effectively move forward uh, equity in the COVID response um, and maybe help us reach the PEPFAR moment, James, that you've, uh, you've alluded to. So maybe we could start, uh, Paul, with you and then Ruth and close out with James. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, um, I think it's since we're talking about neoliberalism and other grand thoughts, I would just point out that um, just because uh, we work with non-governmental organizations and, you know, we all do, all three of us, I mean, Harvard is a non-governmental organization as well, doesn't mean we can't work to support public sector commitments to the kind of equity platforms that we're all talking about, the kind of laws that James and Ruth have laid out in greater detail. You know, and I think we need more of that. When you look at colonial rule in, in Sierra Leone, for example, the British were there for 200 years. They not only founded zero medical schools, they founded zero nursing schools in their long tenure and banned black doctors from the colonial medical service. So we have so much to catch up with in focusing on two areas, one higher education and the other uh, the delivery of high quality services, even when they're tertiary as well. So I think that's something all of us could work on and should. <laughs> 
So I think I think uh, Ruth asked for me to go go next. Um, so you know I, I I you know I know Tony and John are going to be in the next next session. Um, and I guess you know the the question that I would ask and I would ask all of us to do is in this pandemic. You know, one thing that has become absolutely clear is that the global is the local and the local is the global. We have no real chance of ending this pandemic until we deal with this globally, right? You know, what happens in Wuhan impacts what happens in Brooklyn six weeks later. What happens in Cape Town impacts what happens in Brooklyn three weeks later. I'm in Brooklyn, just FYI. And there, there is no way that we will ever get to where we need to be um, domestically in this pandemic uh, until we deal with this global inequity. So even if you want to ignore the massive humanitarian crisis that's going on, even if you want to ignore the massive structural inequities that this pandemic is generating globally, just in our own self-interest, we must deal with this pandemic globally. And what I would ask is why the Biden administration is not acting that way. Why isn't the Biden administration taking the policy steps that we need to scale vaccine manufacturing to where we need it, to make sure that we actually get tech transfer so we get that decentralized manufacturing? Why is the Biden administration only spending less than $2 billion on vaccine administration and delivery support globally? That's less than we spend on PEPFAR for administration and delivery support for treatment that's going to a lot less people. What will it take? How many people need to die? How much of the economy needs to be disrupted before the Biden administration gets serious about dealing with the global pandemic? How many more variants do we have to go through before this administration understands that we can't put up walls to end this pandemic? That until we deal with the problem in Africa, in Rwanda, in Central Asia, everywhere around the world, no one will be safe. I do not, under, this is a very basic principle of epidemiology for respiratory viruses. What are we doing? How much will it take? And that's the sort of crisis that we're facing as activists now, is what do we need to do? Do we need to literally drop dead bodies on Ron Klain's lawn before he actually gets this message? How many more people will need to die before this administration gets its act together? Bruce, last thought. I think um, over the last, you know, four or five years, we are just now beginning to re-engage multilaterally. And one of the key um, ways forward is to ensure that the multilateral institutions um, that regulate much of what happens in low and middle income countries be held accountable for the kinds of policies and the consequences of those policies um, as affects uh, global health um, in the global south. This is really important and I have specifically in mind uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, um, its role in conjunction with the World Trade Organization, in conjunction with the, um, with the UN, that there's got to be an alignment between what we advocate and what we are committed to in public health and global health equity, and the economics of globalization and global markets. We treat these as though they were in silos. And what is really clear is that if we ignore the markets and the organizations that regulate these markets and that create global policies for these markets, we will always see inequity as a built-in design of global public health. And so holding multilateralism accountable for equitable outcomes is a key commitment that we must make as a country and that as citizens, we should insist upon wherever we live. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna quote John Schaefer and just say, I'm also feeling hopeful. Um, I, you know, This session, I think really shows us this call to action that is absolutely needed in this pandemic. So we come out of this really on the right side of history. So I'm gonna thank our panelists, um, Ruth, James, Paul, really thank you for your time and for the passion, for the examples, for the lessons. And I'm gonna pass it over to Ingrid for our next fireside chat. Thank you all. Thank you once again to our esteemed panelists for their invaluable insights and practical recommendations. We'll now be moving to our fireside chat between Dr. Tony Fauci and Dr. John Nkengasong. 
Neither of these two need introductions, but I would like to at least point out a few pieces about their, their bio. Dr. Anthony Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases. He was appointed to this role in 1984 and has advised seven presidents during his time at the helm of NIAID. He was one of the principal architects of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, the flagship global HIV program that has saved millions of lives in more than 50 countries around the world with high burdens of HIV. Dr. Fauci is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science, among many others. He has been a longstanding hero to us in the HIV community, both for his seminal contributions to understanding how HIV destroys the body's immune system and his role in the creation of PEPFAR. He's now a hero to all Americans and so many others around the world as he continues to lead the US as the White House Chief Medical Advisor on COVID-19. And we welcome you here today, Dr. Fauci. We also have Dr. John Nkengasong. He is the founding director of the Africa CDC. He is a leading virologist with 30 years of experience in public health, serving previously as the deputy principal director of the Center for Global Health at the US CDC. He was recently nominated by President Biden for ambassador at large and coordinator of the US government activities to combat HIV AIDS, which oversees PEPFAR. The Infectious Diseases Society of America put out a statement this past fall in strong support of his nomination for this role, noting the selection of Dr. Nkengasong as a bold and inspiring choice at this critical moment in global health. He has used his public health expertise to champion effective and accessible approaches to strengthening global health equity a special envoy to the Director General of the World Health Organization for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. He has seen firsthand what COVID-19 has done to vital health systems and how the world must better prepare for future pandemics. We're so thrilled to have you both joining us today. Our goal is really to consider the lessons from HIV and how we can apply them to the most pressing scientific and implementation challenges in achieving control over the COVID-19 pandemic, and ultimately to develop a more just and equitable approach to responding to future pandemics. As a reminder to the audience, we have incorporated many of the questions that were submitted by you all ahead of time. And while we may not have, an have time to answer all the questions in the chat today, we appreciate you continuing to put them in there and we will incorporate them for our consideration as we move forward. So I'd like to start with a broad question that we asked our panelists. You both have been deeply involved in the global HIV response and now occupy unique positions in the global COVID-19 response. What do you think are some of the most important lessons, both successes and failures from our HIV response that can inform or should inform our COVID-19 response? And I might start with Dr. Fauci for this one. Thank you, Ingrid. It's great to be with you and great to share this panel with my good friend and colleague, John. Um, well, going back to some of the things that were said on the previous panel, uh, if you take PEPFAR as an example of the fact that we in the developed world, rich countries, I have always felt, and that was really one of the spurs that got me involved with President George W. Bush with PEPFAR, is that HIV AIDS is a global pandemic. And I feel strongly that we have a moral responsibility as a rich nation to provide equity in the availability and the implementation of interventions that are life-saving in our own country, be it the United States or the UK or the European Union, that people in the lower and middle income countries don't have the opportunity or the resources to have. That was one of the driving forces of PEPFAR. There really is 
a great similarity when we think of the importance of the issue of equity when you're dealing with a global pandemic of COVID that requires a global response. And it really goes both ways, Ingrid. It goes both ways in that particularly when you have an outbreak that is a respiratory born illness, that as I believe James Krellenstein said, you know, what happens in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia gets to Brooklyn and vice versa. Uh, it goes both ways. So we have, a, I believe, a responsibility, both morally, but as clear, objective public health measures to make sure that we address the outbreak of COVID-19 in a very similar way that we successfully did with PEPFAR and the Global Fund to get sure that we have the equity that's an important responsibility as members of the human society. So that, in my mind, is one of the most important things. Thank you. Dr. Nikangasan? No, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And let me just um, use this opportunity to also recognize the, 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 the presence of uh, Dr. Fauci, whom I met in, um, over the years, has been a, a virtual mentor. And you said in some of the seminar talks about the pathogenesis of HIV that when we were in graduate school, uh, we didn't have textbooks in HIV. So we used to um, use lectures where the textbooks that we, we use in preparing our thesis. So I think it's really an honor. And in uh, a 2001 or 2002 timeline, uh, Dr. Fauci was in my lab in Abidjan, where they flew in with uh, uh, Tommy Thompson from, um, with the former secretary, Tommy Thompson from Botswana to Addis to Abidjan, and they came to my lab, and I have a picture of him. He and I just talking about inside the lab, talking about um, and thinking through that. Lab. I still have that picture, which Tony, I'll send that to you at some point. But that was really the founding of uh, of PEPFAR, which um, truly has become um, a, a transformational for uh, 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 the continent and, and the world in, in global health. Has actually being, uh, I believe when the history of HIV AIDS is written, uh, the chapter devoted to PEPFAR uh, will be unique because it shows the, the, what um, strong political leadership and strong political will can do and commitment can do. Uh, when PEP, before PEPFAR was launched, we saw what the devastation, what HIV was doing in Africa. I mean, life expectancy in some countries like Botswana, uh, was actually plummeting, and we, you can see the curve that brings back that life expectancy up in several countries because of a uh, unique contribution of PEPFAR. Unfortunately, I would not uh, be speaking about PEPFAR here, and Dr. Fauci knows well, the, the reason why, as a nominee, I cannot speak on, on those uh, things, but I would really just reflect on, on the COVID, which is my current job as the director of Africa CDC. We have seen that um, and the lesson number one from COVID from where I sit is uh, that the connectivity, that, uh, that we are more connected in the world today than we thought we were, that we are more vulnerable at the same time than what we thought we were, and the inequities that we knew existed are larger than what we, we, we even thought in terms of not just be, uh, between rich countries and developed countries, but even within countries and between regions within the same continent, say for Africa, of Africa. So those are, I always start with that because um, it speaks to the fact that there are so many lessons that we, we have in our toolkits in controlling pandemics that can truly be applied uh, to in a very significant manner, deliberate manner to fighting um, uh, COVID, uh, uh, this COVID pandemic. Uh, I always say HIV AIDS is still a pandemic. Uh, so we are now dealing with two pandemics and you know, that's how you see it. And if you look at that, I mean, the, uh, I've reflected on this and I said the best way for us to prepare for the next pandemic is really to look at, to focus on strengthening national systems and services that uh, have enabled us to fight um, the HIV pandemic and bring the curve and, and, and kind of bring back the curve that was going down up, which I started with. And if we do that right, then we use that in controlling 
the endemic diseases and outbreaks, which will become fundamental in our ability to fight pandemics uh, going forward because it's always the same system. The best way to prepare for the unknown is to prepare adequately for the knowns. I think that is, I've always stated that um, over and over. So there are several lessons that we can learn from the way we have managed uh, pandemics in the past to fight this pandemic and bring it under control. Let me just conclude by saying that uh, there are three things that at least from the continent of Africa, we should be looking at in 2022. Uh, that is the ability to scale up vaccines so that we really can move from 10% to 70%. The ability to scale up testing, decentralize it and make it uh, a community-led exercise. That those are lessons that we learned from HIV. We can really uh, apply that uh, in a very deliberate manner. And we begin to work hard to make sure that there's timely access to any new drugs that are available so that we borrow from the test and treat model for in HIV and apply it to, uh, to, to COVID as well, so that uh, we prevent our health system from being overwhelmed. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I hope that um, we continue to uh, expand on this as needed. Thank you for that. I mean, I think the point you're raising about connectivity, I think is one of the key pieces that we're trying to think about here both with the HIV response that we've had and the COVID-19 response. And I, I guess I pose to both of you, how do we proactively design a landscape where public goods like vaccines and testing and therapeutics, which often are developed with public funds, really rapidly reach people globally and try to bring pandemics under control? Because if it's not COVID-19 now, it will be um, additional pandemics in the future. So maybe I'll, I'll go back to Dr. Fauci to start that one off. You know, Ingrid, th th that is obviously a, a critical issue that is not easily solvable because, for example, if you take the drug, I mean, the vaccines is an example, the direct antivirals is another example. Namely, the scientific approach was unprecedented in its success with developing a vaccine, plural vaccines for COVID-19. Um, the contracts that were made by the developed world to buy and distribute vaccines are obviously understandable. But one of the things that we have to, when I say looking forward as lessons learned, that right from the get-go, there has to be the formula that this is something that's a broad global responsibility. And I don't know, I don't have the answer for you, Ingrid, about how we're going to make sure that the developing low and middle income countries don't get something a year or two later, but get it simultaneously. And I think there needs to be at a global level, I mean, whatever that leadership is, the G7, the G20, the WHO, to make sure when these things happen that countries feel the responsibility and also industry feels the responsibility. The idea that industry is not making a lot of money on this, I think is naive to think that that's not the case. So therefore there's gotta be some sort of global responsibility. The same holds true for antivirals. I mean, we have some very good antiviral drugs right now. Uh, one as an example, and I hope there will be even better ones than that, but one that's a good example is Paxlovid, in which is still very much so in limited supply. Through no one's fault, it's a multi-stage synthetic process that takes months. But there needs to be a global approach to that, as opposed to the same sort of bringing the availability of a drug sort of selectively to different countries. It's got to be a plan. And again, I'm, I'm being quite humble and modest. I don't have the solution to it, but I know what we have to do. We can't have the almost inherent inequity, inequity that seems to dominate all kinds of outbreaks that we have, whatever it is. It started off, it was the same way with HIV, and you know the the subject of this of this discussion between you and I and John is sort of the back and forth and the relevance of what was happening and had happened with HIV and what's happening now. You know there were some really important successes 
that we did with HIV and particularly the idea of generics. Remember, history tells us going back, because I was intimately involved in those conversations, how can we get drugs to the developing world when in the United States and in the developed world, it's $18,000 to $25,000 a year for a regimen, which would inherently make it impossible to get those drugs to low and middle income countries. It took a lot of work with generics. It took a lot of work with looking at intellectual property to make that happen. And I think we need to do the same thing right now with COVID-19. Dr. Kengesan? Uh, absolutely. Let me um, say that I shared uh, uh, a lot of the, the, the sentiments expressed by uh, Dr. Fauci here, because um, we've seen this over and over. When I was um, uh, in, in, involved, I remember in 2002 at the AIDS conference in Durban in Cape Town, uh, marching the streets as, uh, with all kinds of board asking for, uh, advocating for um, uh, 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 access to ARVs, and here we are with vaccines uh, at, at about 20 years down the road. I think, um, like him, I don't think I'd have the, the, the answers, but here is what I think. Uh, regionalization in manufacturing is, in, is key and, in, and has to be done in a very deliberate manner. Uh, we at Africa CDC and the African Union have endorsed uh, um, it, they're thinking that you need a new public health order for the continent to uh, to begin to address its health security needs. A new public health order that really emphasizes manufacturing, manufacturing of, of diagnostics, manufacturing of drugs, manufacturing of vaccines. I'm very encouraged that, um, to, that we launched the African Vaccine Acquisition, uh, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing and there are about nine countries now that have engaged on that journey for vaccine manufacturing. Just yesterday, I was on the occasion, uh, an occasion with the South African president, President Amaposa, where he launched uh, a manufacturing site with uh, Dr. Patrick Sonshu um, uh, for, to, for a biotech manufacturing site to produce vaccines and other uh, pharmaceuticals. That's the kind of initiative that must be encouraged so that um, we begin to manufacture vaccines or, or, or the regions begin to manufacture vaccines, diagnostics, and other commodities that are needed to fight pandemics in peacetime before we are faced in, in, a, in a really pandemic. There. I think that is what I said earlier, that the best way to prepare for the unknowns is to adequately support the, the knowns. And the continent is challenged with a lot of the known uh, challenges that we can invest and should invest in. So I think that point, the point here is regionalization as much as possible, transfer of technology as much as possible. We are beginning to see several uh, agreements signed between the government of Senegal, Bountech and, and uh, Rwanda, uh, South Africa with the mRNA hub that WHO has established with Africa CDC and uh, uh, what Morocco is doing with them. So I'm very optimistic that in the next years to come, uh, if confronted with another pandemic, maybe and just maybe, the way we fight that pandemic will be very different from the way we are fighting this in terms of new uh, uh, diagnostics and, and, pharmacy and, and pharmaceuticals as well as vaccines. Let me just say this, that I don't think any country goes to uh, wakes up in the morning and say, oh, we're going to manufacture vaccines and then deny Africa these vaccines. I don't think any country does that. It's uh, any country's interest to protect their, uh, their citizens. I think that uh, that thinking is, 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 is understood. I mean, that is just, I mean, however, uh, the missing link in that equation of thinking is that uh, you don't get, uh, you don't deal with a fast moving respiratory disease in isolation. That, I mean, even if you have the best technology, the best resources, the, the best way to do that is to address it from a more uh, a global perspective so that we, we, we stop it uh, uh, across uh, the board. So I think um, but that thinking of how do we regionalize our global health security architecture is extremely important so that we do not get uh, trapped in, uh, again into these vicious cycles of accusations uh, that nobody wants that. It erodes uh, what I call the, the trust capital that is required for all of us to tackle bigger issues and even further pandemics there. So again, um, that is the trust that we are pushing the continent from the African Union and the Africa CDC perspective for the continent to be self-sufficient to the best it can uh, in producing vaccine and diagnostics. Let me just say this, I mean, for 
the 40 years we've lived with HIV AIDS, there's no country in Africa that produces a simple rapid test. Okay, why is that important? If countries are producing that, say in Senegal, South Africa, Morocco, it is very easy to repurpose that technology into producing other diagnostics for emerging diseases than to start from scratch. You know, I mean, those are the challenges that we face in 2020 when COVID just hit where there, there was no country in Africa that had to scramble and move countries to Senegal and train them over the, the weekend and rapidly deploy back. I mean, and th that kind of uh, uh, reactive behavior should be corrected. And the only way to do that is to do that collectively. Ingrid, if I could just take a second and, and expand uh, and really underscore something that John said throughout the theme of what he his 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 um, discussion just over the last minute or two, and that is, you know, things repeat themselves over and over again. And so the scenario that I see is that if we want to get vaccines now, that over the next year, to people in lower middle income countries, the quickest way to get it is to just manufacture it in where it's being manufactured and give it to them. But that's not the long term solution. So what I'm afraid happens is that John, under, uh, John emphasized and underscored we need in-country capacity for everything, for vaccine manufacture, for drug manufacturing, for diagnostic manufacturing, just the way he said, you know, 40 years later, we still don't have in-country capability for things that relate to HIV. The problem is that you've got to look at what the next challenge is going to be, because we can say, well... It's too late to build capacity now for the current outbreak. Let's get through it. But then corporate memory fails and we don't do it so that it's not ready for the next one. And it's kind of like Groundhog Day, you know, over and over again. We don't have the capacity, so we do something else to fill it in. And then we don't build the capacity because the threat is gone. You've got to build the capacity even when there is not an ongoing threat so that when you do get the threat, the capacity is already there. It really sounds somewhat simplistic, but we haven't addressed that over the last several decades. And I hope that one of the lessons learned now will be, let's start it right now and maybe it will contribute to the current outbreak. But even if the current outbreak disappears, don't stop developing the capacity. So I think these points are exactly what we are trying to touch upon. And I see a lot of people in the chat here around engagement. And I think Dr. Nkengasong spoke about people in the streets. And Dr. Fauci, I think you're really alluding to kind of holding people accountable for especially given these are public goods. And I wonder how can we in the HIV community, we have academics here, we have um, activists here, we have legal scholars here, most effectively advocate for global equity in our responses to pandemics moving forward, not just in this moment, but as we come into the times ahead and really hold on to that memory so that it isn't just a response, emergency, forget, response, emergency, forget. And I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Fauci, and then we'd love to hear from Dr. Nkengasong too. Well, Ingrid, I, I think that both John and I have alluded to that a bit already. And that is that we've got to make it a standard part of everything we do. We can't make it reactive. We've got to make it proactive so that it is a given that we have to engage at a global level even before something happens not the many, many conversations that John and I have had where we're always playing catch up. You, playing catch up with a pandemic is a losing game because the virus tends to always be a step ahead of us. So we can't play catch up. We gotta proactively be prepared for the kind of engagement and the kind of equity before it actually happens. And that's the only way I think we're gonna do it. And we have to keep the pressure on and you say, those of us in the HIV community, is our, it's our responsibility. I mean, mine too. I mean, I've spent the last 40 years of my life engaged in HIV and, and AIDS, and we've got to make it an absolute important part and an important element of everything we do.
Agreed. Dr. Nkengson. No, I fully agree. There, there is, um, uh, uh, when we talk of inequities, uh, uh, the, the tendency now, because it's driven by the pressures that we are living with, is to say, well, manufacturers uh, give vaccines to the developing uh, countries or uh, the low and middle income countries. Th th that is good to uh, turn off the burning fire, but that doesn't solve a long term solution. I'll just give you some uh, uh, the statistics here. Africa imports 99% of its vaccines. This is a continent of 1.3 billion people. 1.3 billion people. Manufactures only 1% of the vaccines and is capable of doing more. Uh, we have to step back and look at equity very broadly and say, how do we enable uh, uh, the, the continent to, to ramp up the vaccine manufacturing and diagnostics? I really always go back to diagnostics because that is fundamental. We had these conversations uh, at the start of 2020, where uh, the, the, the protest, the advocacy piece was on diagnostics. We didn't even know we were going to have vaccines. So I always like to take vaccine diagnostics and therapeutics together. And secondly, look at what is it that we can do to reshape the market? Because uh, it is extremely important that we look at this in a very holistic way, where we say, we make an argument that, well, for Rwanda, the Senegal's, the South Africa's to manufacture vaccines in Morocco, you have to have a, mar a market for that. The reason that um, the Serum Institute in India and other uh, manufacturers in China are successful is because the global health, uh, the vaccine delivery architecture has been designed that way. That way, uh, let's say, for example, Gavi gets uh, resources, support the, the Serum Institute and others to uh, produce then uh, import, which is okay at that time when it was conceived, but we are seeing the limitations of that. And the only failures that we are, can admit is failure to admit that there have been failures in that model. And we have to step back now and look at uh, what is it that we can do to reshape the market so that it can enable the, the emerging countries in different regions, not just Africa, that are interested in vaccine manufacturing and diagnostics to be competitive. I think if we do that and project, have a long-term view of this, then we are on our way to addressing the structural uh, uh, elements that govern uh, some parts of the inequity. So inequity should not just be looked at in terms of company X producing vaccines now and then failing to distribute that to, um, to others or countries uh, uh, holding vaccines, as I said, earlier, it is the responsibility of, of, of every nation to protect its citizens. And you do that in any way, in matter that you have. Uh, but we're saying that in a pandemic, a global threat like this, you have to have that bigger picture to see that, yes, I can protect my citizens, rightfully so, but um, you will not fully protect them if, in other words, it's not charity by making sure that you have uh, equitable access to vaccines out there. It is actually for your self-interest if we do uh, take that kind of a, 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 a global perspective. I recognize, unfortunately, we have just another minute. So I'm going to ask one final question of you both, which is where should the responsibility lie? Should it be, and what role should the US government play? Should it be a partner with the WHO, with the Africa CDC? How can we ensure essentially there are sufficient funds to develop this manufacturing capacity and provide optimal regulatory framework for, the, for COVID and for future pandemics? And maybe I'll pass it back to Dr. Fauci for his closing thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I think the United States as we've done in so many other situations being a rich country and one of the leading countries in the world, it's, it's really our responsibility to provide leadership and to engage. And that's the reason why I was so pleased. One of the first things I did as the chief medical advisor to the president was to re-engage with WHO literally on the same day as the inauguration of the president. So that's the first thing that we need to do is to get back into the game globally. We are leaders and, 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 and there's a responsibility that comes with leadership. And that responsibility is to make sure we engage with all the countries which very often follow our leadership. So I think the United States has a special role and a special responsibility, which I believe we already are doing in all fairness in the, in the respect of the things that we're doing now to try and get doses and well as capacity in lower and middle income countries. Are we doing enough? No, we, we're never doing enough until you essentially solve the problem. But we really need to continue as well as I think it's important to say, engage other countries because the United States cannot do it alone. 
we can provide leadership, we can provide the bulk of some of the resources, but we have to have the engagement of other countries in the world, both the developed countries and the lower middle income countries. So we accept the responsibility that we have, but we also need to have engagement and participation with other countries in the world. Well said. Dr. Nkengasan, any oh, Thank you, thank you, Ingrid. I think, let me uh, maybe end uh, where I started, by uh, recognizing the, the, the leadership of the United States um, in, in global health and global health security. The world has always been in a better place when the United States have exercised the, the great leadership period. I think uh, we saw that with HIV AIDS, we saw that with polio, we've seen that with malaria, as, uh, et cetera. So that means, the United States has uh, perhaps, in my view, the greatest uh, uh, public health assets globally. I think um, all of, uh, if you look at just continent of Africa, uh, what uh, uh, previous programs have put in place is tremendous. And you can actually leverage those uh, global health assets that um, over the years, the United States have uh, supported to uh, really support the countries to uh, uh, fight this uh, pandemic in a very decisive manner. So I think that, uh, but that again, I agree with Dr. Fauci that it is true partnerships. I mean, the United States leadership, even as impactful and insightful as it has always been, uh, it has to always reside on the power of partnership. It is transformational if the United States brings its leadership to the table and encourage others and rally others to around that leadership, it becomes decisive and, and transformational. Thank you. Thank you both so much for taking time with us today and for helping us envision what a future paradigm might look like and for really achieving global equity here. And we also want to thank you both for your ongoing commitments to public health throughout the world. We know these are incredibly hard times for both of you and we are all so collectively grateful for your leadership. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you for having us and thank, thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass it now back for the final comments from our Harvard Global Health Institute Interim Faculty Director, Professor Alan Brandt, for closing reflections on today's event. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ingrid. <clears throat> this has just been a remarkable session filled with ideas and insights and passion. And I just want to say as a historian, um, I'm struck because there are so many lessons in how we have dealt with epidemics and disparities in the past, some of which we have been able to utilize, but so many of which have been um, just passed, and we haven't taken the opportunity or the insight to utilize. So just in quickly reflecting on today's discussion, I would just want to emphasize that it seems so many times that we have a remarkable 21st century science and technology, but we are continuing to utilize our public health institutions in largely 19th century separate nation state orientations. And not only does this handicap us right now in thinking about how to get COVID under control, but it is a devastating future in terms of thinking about pandemics as they come. So we both need to figure out some things immediately about COVID, but also to be thinking about a radical restructuring, a radical reimagining of global health and public health moving forward. And I think the signs are really here about what we need to do collaboration, cooperation, um, engagement, these things are absolutely clear. But I think the real insight of this meeting and what we can take from this current moment is that equity is not simply an ethical idea or a moral value. It's the essential key to global health. And the degree to which we let health disparities grow, makes us all vulnerable to future pandemics. And the extent to which we really assert equity and advocate for it and develop activist commitments to it, gives us the possibility of 
being able to be far more resilient, not just around COVID-19 now, but pandemics in the future. And I learned so much today. I want to thank all of our speakers. I want to thank our fantastic moderators. And I have to say the chat is filled with insights, ideas, citations, and I invite everyone to try to save and utilize the chat. But this is such an important discussion. Our hope um, at the Global Health Institute and at CIFAR is that this is be the beginning of a sustained, constructive, advocacy-oriented discussion that will really change the way we consider global health and the health of the world. Thank you very much.